Thank you, Chiara. Taking over uh, swiftly here, Martin Benisch, uh, Chiara already mentioned it, I'm acting head of the legislation division in the legal services uh, of the ECB. And it's a great pleasure to uh, chair this panel on the second day of the conference. This uh, panel will center around procurement issues. The starting point for uh, this panel will be the ECB internal review procedure for contract award decisions, i.e. the procurement review body or PRB. This is a mechanism that does not exist in any other EU institution um, and therefore is, is interesting and unique. We will compare it with the legal framework for the review of uh, such decisions in other EU international and national organizations. It will include stock taking after 15 years of the decisions and experience with the PRB, um, an assessment of the impact of recent case law on review procedures and the requirements for obtaining interim relief from the Court of Justice of the European Union, as well as practical problems that arise, for example, in terms of the national regime. I'm super proud and happy to be in a, a panel uh, of uh, super experts. I can uh, already mention that. Uh, I just mentioned the names at the moment. Isabel Köpfer, who is sitting next to me. The camera will pick her up when, as soon as she says it, peep. Hello. <laughs> Let's say more. OK. Yeah, now I'm there. Hello. Yeah, this, this Welcome is, the, to the, this is a, the feature of, of video, uh, video conference that sometimes the, the camera is not following what you want to do. Isabel Köpfer is advisor in the legal services of the ECB in the Institutional Law Division. Secondly, we have uh, Jeff Dirix, Senior Advisor, Head of Group Legal uh, Department in the Nationale Bank van België, Banque Nationale de Belgique. And we have, last but not least, Laura uh, André, Member of the Legal Service uh, of the European Commission. I will introduce them in more detail, but always at the beginning of their respective presentations. Please allow me some introductory thoughts on the issue. A common theme of all of these presentations will be the importance of communication in the relationship between contracting authority on one hand and tenders on the other side, during but even after the selection process has ended. This raises the question, why is it beneficial for contracting authorities and tenders to communicate in a transparent manner and keep doing so throughout the process? What role does communication have in this relationship? Or to put it a bit more bluntly, assuming that all legal obligations have been complied with, why would contracting authorities want to communicate and rethink rather than simply going through with their decision unilaterally and not care about the unsuccessful tenders? On the other hand, why would bidders be at all interested in communicating with the contracting authority and staying in dialogue even after a non-successful procurement procedure? There must be a benefit for both parties to stay in contact, keep communication channels open, and take time to explain the own perspective. How does a perfect communication look in the first place? Academics define seven C's that effective information has to comply with. Information must be complete, concise, clear, courteous. That's an interesting one, so polite, uh, but also, um, um, yeah. Uh, avoiding expressions that hurt validity. Concrete, considerate, and correct. So no false information. That is an interesting uh, requirement. This means a lot can go wrong when bidders and um, contracting authorities exchange information in the process. For instance, information can be forgotten or go missing, can be too bulky with the risk of relevant aspects being overlooked, be ambiguous, delayed or offensive, be too vague, not clear enough, not meeting the expectations of the receiver, or simply false. This confirms the clear need of all participants in procurement processes to keep all involved parties, contracting authorities on the one side and bidders on the other side, informed in a consistent manner. Subject, of course, to what is permissible in the procurement process at hand. Now, imagine that the tender process is decided and bids have been rejected. What is the role of information and communication then or one step ahead in the case of imminent judicial conflict? The UK Ministry of Defence considers that in terms of conflict management, much depends on the quality of the debrief. Hence, how well 
the reasons are explained why bidders were not successful. Academics confirm that good debriefing diffuses protests also by giving contractors a better understanding and control over the risk of improperly losing the award. Information helps suppliers to reassess and understand changes necessary, which they have to do to improve their own business and be better in the next bid. Information also makes the bidders more tender ready or contract ready and makes future bids more successful. An evaluation of small and medium sized enterprises, SMEs, access to public procurement in the EU reported that no debriefing was one of the top four biggest problems companies face when participating in public procurement. Meaningful feedback and clear communication allow small and medium sized enterprises to understand why they lost and why another company won. This has also a strong potential to reduce litigation. And that is why it is indeed beneficial to communicate in a transparent manner and to keep communicating throughout the process. So with this small introduction now, I would like to go over to the presentations of the panelists and we start with uh, Isabel Köpfer uh, to my side. Isabel will talk about the ECB's internal appeal procedure for contract award decisions. She will be outlining the ECB's status as supranational organization of the European Union and will give an overview of the ECB procurement rules. We have our own set, therefore. The main part is then about the communication of the outcome of selection, award and rejection decisions and remedies of tenders. And uh, in public tender procedures in particular, the ECB procurement rule, rules allow unsuccessful candidates and tenders to challenge the ECB's award and rejection decisions with an appeal to the already mentioned PRB procurement review body, which is quite unique within the EU institutions, to say it again. Furthermore, the presentation includes an assessment of the impact of recent case law on review procedures and the requirements for obtaining interim relief from the Court of Justice of the EU. And then, of course, a stock taking after 15 years of uh, decisions of the PRB, in which I think Isabel was involved for some part of it, some substantial part of it. Isabel, just who the person is currently, I mentioned it, advisor in the bank notes procurement and accounting session within the ECB institutional law decision. Isabel joined the ECB in 2007 and has 20 years work experience in contract and procurement law. She has previously worked with uh, GIZ, Gesellschaft für Internationale Zusammenarbeit, International Corporation, a German government owned organization in the field of international cooperation for sustainable development. And before that, at an internet in the international law firm, Allen Overy LLP. Isabel has studied at the University, University Nanterre, Paris, the University of London, SOAS, and Wolfgang Goethe, Universität Frankfurt am Main. She is a postgraduate in EU law from the University of London and obtained a PhD in environmental law from the uh, Wolfgang Goethe Universität Frankfurt am Main. So that was the introduction, and now we go over to the first presentation. We are looking forward to listen to Isabel Köpfer's presentation. Isabel, please. Thank you very much, Martin, for the kind introduction. Can I can I have the slides, mm -hmm. please? So, <clears throat> as already announced, uh, the first topic uh, is uh, the ECB's internal appeal procedure for contract award decisions. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, yeah, it's as Martin already mentioned, it's a, a formalized uh, procedure, which is quite unique because other EU institutions uh, don't have such a mechanism in place. And it was already uh, praised by the by the European Court of Justice as um, an effective uh, remedy and uh, more detail to that later. So let me start by giving you an overview on, on the presentation. I'll first start with uh, the, the status of the ECB as supranational organization of the EU. And then I'll give you a quick overview on the ECB procurement law framework um, to give you a little bit more background how, how, how procurements work at the ECB. Then I'll move on to the communication of the outcome and the remedies to the tenderers. And uh, then I'll give you some insights on how the ECB internal appeal procedure, the 
and with the so-called procurement review body works, uh, also uh, explain about the rules of procedure and requirements and the scope of review of the PRB. And last but not least, how effective is this remedy uh, as a matter of fact? Okay, um, so the ECB as a supranational organization of, of the EU has the autonomous power to lay down its own rules for internal organization and administration. You can already uh, click the, the next column. Exactly, that's what I need first. Um, so due to this, this principle, national procurement and budgetary laws do not apply to the ECB. The EU procurement directives do also not apply as they are addressed directly to the member states. And the EU financial regulation does also not apply. It only applies to, to the other EU institutions um, as the ECB has its own budget. Of course, uh, this does not mean that the, the ECB is entirely free to establish its own procurement law regime. Um, the, the principles of the EU treaties apply, in particular the free movement of goods, free, the freedoms uh, of establishment and the freedom to provide services, and also the, the principles of uh, procurement uh, which are derived therefrom and which were established by the Court of Justice of the EU, such as uh, equal treatment and non-discrimination, mutual recognition, proportionality and transparency. And since the award decisions of the ECB and tender procedures are subject to judicial review by the European courts, it's also the, the jurisprudence of such courts that are relevant for the ECB. Next slide, please. Against this background, the ECB has established uh, its own legal framework for, for procurement procedures, first by way of internal guidelines, and as of 2007, by way of binding decisions adopted by the Executive Board and published in the official journal of the EU. As you can see, and one more click, please. As you can see from, from the slide, the ECB has changed uh, its, its decision uh, since 2007, six times. It has completely uh, recasted uh, EC the ECB decision in 2016. And um, the, the rules mainly draw on the EU procurement directive. Okay, then let's move on to the next slide. Uh, in terms of types of procedures, you can also see that uh, it, it doesn't differ from the, the rules of the, or the tender procedures stipulated in the EU procurement directive. That's why I will not go into, into details. You, you, will, we, you, you will know uh, how the, the procurement procedures uh, under the EU procurement directives work. So we have um, the, the, the thresholds that are also the same as in the directives because we directly refer to those. Above the thresholds, we have uh, uh, the, the typical public tender procedures the restricted negotiated procedure, competitive dialogue, innovation partnership, and the open procedure. And below the thresholds, we have installed um, a simplified procedure, and we call it 3-5 quote procedure, which is less strict than the public tender procedures. So less deadlines, we can invite tenderers depending on, on how high the value is. And uh, usually we do not publish an, an official, an official an, um, a notice in the official journal. Okay, next slide, please. And we also have the, the typical um, exceptions, like in the EU procurement directive, uh, which establishes for certain type of contracts that fall outside the scope of the, EP, also outside the ECB procurement rules, such as uh, cooperation agreements between other ECB and other institutions, public institutions, the acquisition and, and rental of buildings, for example, also employment contracts and legal representation of the ECB in court proceedings. Then we have what we call the single supplier exceptions, um, where we can award direct contracts uh, to certain companies due to, for example, technical uh, requirements or also in the case of extreme urgency and secrecy. And uh, we have special contracts where the cross-border dimension is not so important or where an element of trust is required, like for security or legal services or restaurant services, um, which are more regional. So it's largely the same as in the EU procurement directive. 
Next slide, please. So then let's move on to the communication of the outcome of the award decisions to unsuccessful tenderers. Uh, we send an outcome letter within 10 days, a standstill period, and we indicate the reasons for rejecting application and tenders. So what are the reasons? Uh, those are uh, the, the main um, and the subscoring of the own tender and the written explanations. And that's usually an excerpt of the evaluation matrix. And upon request of the tenderer, they can ask for additional information um, regardless of the standstill period. So that request can also come after the standstill period has elapsed. Um, if the tender was admissible, they can ask for the name and the key characteristics, the relative advantages um, of the winning tenderer. And we have uh, the, the, the possibility for public tender procedures uh, for an appeal procedure within 10 days upon receipt of the outcome letter. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, we had, so, th so this uh, regime is in place for two years now, since the last update of, uh, of the ECB procurement rules. Previously, we had a different notification regime, um, which we call two-step procedure. It was a little bit different in so far as in the first step, we have only disclosed in the outcome letter um, a high-level score, uh, which is a high-level comparison uh, of the scoring of, for example, quality and, and price. No subscoring was, uh, was provided. And only in the second step, upon request, additional information could be requested within 15 days. Um, and the information that can, could be requested was the reasons for rejecting the tender. Um, and on top of that, copies of all evaluation documents relating to the own tender. And if the tender was admissible, again, like in the previous approach, uh, the name of the winning tenderer, key characteristics, and so on, and copies of all evaluation documents relating to the winning tender. So this is very comprehensive and it, it cost us a lot of sometimes when we had additional uh, requests from tenderers, a lot of administrative burden. And each time they asked, they asked for ad additional information, the standstill period was extended. Um, and, and this, of course, the contract conclusion was also suspended. In some cases, we had several additional information requests and uh, in the worst case, an average duration of three months um, for, for the whole procedure. So um, next slide, please. Uh, we actually, we wanted to always change this approach um, as we, we also gave out more information that we actually weren't uh, legally required, in particular, the copies of all evaluation documents. The contracting authority is not uh, obliged to provide that. And then, Another thing happened, so we had a game changer, Van Bre the Van Breda judgment in 2015, um, which <clears throat> sort of obliged us to, to change uh, the old approach. Um, as some of you might be aware, Van Breda eased the conditions for the award of interim measures. So until then, it was practically impossible um, to, um, to, to have or uh, to gain interim relief uh, for unsuccessful tenderers um, because damage could always be compensated in, in money. So now in, in the Van Breda case, the court said that it's sufficient to prove serious instead of irreparable harm in order to preserve the principle of effective judicial protection. And, um, and this made us think that we had already concerns about our previous notification regime because what we provided in the first step was not a an, 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 an minimum amount of information that was necessary um, to trigger the standstill period. Uh, the court now emphasized and referred to previous case law in fast web um, that award decisions have to be challenged before the courts within the standstill period before the contract is concluded. After the expiry of the standstill period, contracting authorities can, can award the contract and tenders can merely claim for damages. So the consequence for us was that um, we have to we had to provide more information in in the first step because we were concerned that 
especially for those tenderers who did not ask for additional information, that the standstill period would not start um, running. And this is what was the main reason for, uh, for, for changing our two-step procedure. Okay, next slide, please. So let's move on uh, to, the, to the internal appeal procedure. As such, we established the internal procedure in 2007 and uh, the PRB, so the Procurement Review Body, is an internal body composed of three ECB senior managers and supported by the ECB's Directorate General Legal Services. So I'm the secretary um, of, uh, of, the, of, the, of the procurement review body and I have special tasks, which I'll explain to you in a minute. The PRB is independent from the office carrying out the procurement procedure. And we have established rules of procedure as are set forth in Article 39 of the ECB procurement rules. And we further specified them in the internal mandate of the PRB, which is not public. Next slide, please. Um, so the, the secretariat of the PRB assists in the performance of its tasks. It provides, for example, all members of the PRB with a relevant tender documentation. It liaises with the procurement committee, which is responsible for awarding the contract to clarify the facts. And it summarizes the facts underlying the appeal and um, we also provide a preliminary legal assessment, prepares a first draft of the appeal decision, takes minutes of the PRB meetings, and ensures notification of the appeal decision to the appellant. And, it, and we also manage the PRB archives. So now this is, of course, a, a lot of um, tasks which we have to, to do on top of, of our uh, normal um, job. And uh, so I'm not the only one who's dealing with, with these um, internal appeal procedures. I also have the help of my colleagues uh, in, in, the, in, in the legal services department. Yeah, so the, the main aspects of the internal appeal procedure. The remedy is available to unsuccessful candidates or tenderers only in public tender procedures. So for all other procedures like the, the simplified procedures or call-offs, the, the, the remedy is not possible. And uh, the, the PRB may reject the appeal and it can sustain the appeal and, and order that a tender procedure or parts of it are repeated or take a final decision. Then it's also important to note that the appeal has suspensive effect in relation to the award of the contract, which means that as soon as, an, as, as a tenderer submits an appeal, the, the contract signature is suspended. The appellant must await the ECB's appeal decision before bringing the matter to the Court of Justice. So the appeal procedure is mandatory and a tenderer cannot go right away to the Court of Justice. Then the time limits for judicial remedies uh, are, are two months from the receipt of the appeal decision. And we also uh, have established an additional standstill period for contract awards of at least 10 days upon um, PRB, the, 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 the appeal decision has been issued. So that's what we have to do also uh, as an aftermath of, of Van Breda, because the tenderer, if we make it mandatory on the one hand to go to the appeal body, it, it of course has to have another 10 days um, after the, the decision of the PRB has been issued to bring the matter to the court if it so wishes. Next slide, please. So what are the requirements and the scope of review by the PRB? The requirements for the tenderer um, is that the appeal has to include all supporting information and recent objections. This means that a tenderer cannot simply uh, send us a request, please review the decision, I'm unhappy with it. Um, the, the, the tenderer has to really substantiate um, its, um, its appeal and the reasons why he's unhappy and wants to, to, to submit objections. It cannot uh, submit precluded objections. We have a, a, in, the, in our procurement rules a, um, a clause which requires a tenderer that if he realizes that the tender documents are inconsistent or, or flawed, that, uh, that it has to be notified uh, to, to us immediately within 15 days. And if, if the tender doesn't do so, those objections would be precluded 
in the, in, in the later appeal procedure and also in the court proceedings. Perhaps another, uh, yeah, another interesting uh, fact to know is also that appeals can be submitted in all languages, so we do not only accept English. Uh, we also sometimes have received uh, uh, appeals in German or, or uh, in, in French uh, even, um, so we would also accept that and have it translated then if, if need be. What does the PRB examine? The PRB examines first whether it's admissible, so whether it has been submitted uh, in, in, in due time, so within 10 days of the stancy period, and whether the decision of the ECB to reject the application or tender was taken in line with the ECB procurement rules and with general principles of procurement law. So next slide, please. The scope of the PRB is, is, is limited, um, as um, the ECB has, like any other EU institution, broad discretion in assessing factor, the factors for awarding the contract. So the PRB checks compliance with the procedural rules and the duty to give reasons. It also checks the correctness of the fact found, and it ensures that there is no serious and manifest error of assessment or misuse of powers. So that's in principle what a court would, would review as well. And that's what, what the PRB um, assesses as well in an appeal procedure. Next slide, please. So how effective is this, this remedy? And the General Court and the European Court of Auditors have confirmed that it's an effective remedy and a robust internal review mechanism. The General Court has said that um, it's an effective remedy whose purpose is to ensure that the lawfulness of the award decision is verified by a body separate from the one that initially took the decision and giving rise to a decision open to judicial review. So that's very important that the office, uh, the, is, 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 uh, the, the PRB is independent um, from, from the office um, that initially took uh, the, the, the decision. And, um, so, for example, we may. How do we may? How how do we ensure this? We make sure that um, that if I were involved in the initial procurement procedure, I couldn't act as a PRB secretary. Or also, the one of the managers uh, who's uh, in in the PRB, um, if 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 that manager was involved in the initial uh, procurement review procedure or only gave approval, then this would be a conflict of interest. So, in that in that regard, it's really completely independent and uh, the PRB is supposed to give an, a really objective uh, um, assessment of the award decision taken by the ECB. The ECB receives uh, about between five and 10, 10 appeals per year, but this really differs. Sometimes you only receive, receive one or two and sometimes receive 10. Um, <clears throat> since 2007, we received around 70 appeals and uh, I would say approximately 10% were upheld and the majority was either rejected or settled by presenting the appellant with additional information. The appeals mainly relate to the evaluation of, of the tenders, the, the scoring, and uh, also to formal requirements and selection criteria. All in all, we are convinced that um, with, with this appeal procedure, um, we are in, in ensuring that, uh, that tenders do not have to, to go a further step and bring the matters to the court. So I think that by verifying the initial decision, um, this is a, a very good um, mechanism in terms of uh, transparency. So next slide, please. The Court of Justice um, of the EU has exclusive competence in disputes between the ECB and suppliers concerning procurement procedures. So tenderers uh, cannot go to the national courts, they have to go to the EU courts, so the general court is, is, uh, respond, is, is uh, competent. And uh, we have the time limits of two months, which, which uh, starts two months um, from the seat of the appeal decision. And uh, complaints can also be lodged uh, with the European Ombudsman in, in separately from, from judicial review. Okay. Last slide. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope that uh, this insight in our internal appeal procedure was interesting for you. And uh, yeah, if you have any questions already at this stage, please go ahead.
Thank you very much, Isabel. I propose um, note your questions. I already had two uh, noted down on Isabel's presentation, and we will then collect uh, questions after we have heard all three speakers, and then we can enter into discussion. Possible also the, the speakers can can do so. Uh, we will go next to Laura André. Um, she will speak on the communication between uh, the tenderers and the contracting authorities after the award uh, decision. And uh, on that, we will base her presentation on the regime of the financial regulation. Uh, she will describe the information that may be provided to the uh, tenderers depending on their ranking and the admissibility of their tender, but also the actions that can be taken by the contracting authority and by the tenders following such exchange of information. The presentation will be supported by a summary of the relevant and most recent case law, uh, in which respect we benefit from the fact that Laura is uh, quite involved in uh, a number of these uh, uh, cases without, of course, going giving us any juicy details, unfortunately. We will see. Maybe we can get something out of her here. Um, just a few words on uh, Laura uh, Satch. Laura André is a member of the European Commission Legal Services and an agent of the European Commission before the Court of Justice of the EU. She focuses on legal issues relating to uh, the public procurement of the European institutions and to the interpretations of contracts. Before joining the legal services, she worked as a legal and procurement officer for the Director General for Informatics of the Commission from 2016 to 2019. Prior to joining the European Commission, Laura André worked as a lawyer in the litigation and dispute resolution department of the law firm Stippe in Brussels, that was from 2011 and 2016, where she specialized in cross-border litigation with a particular focus on contractual and commercial law. Laura André, and this is something that we had in the, in the prep meeting found out. Uh, normally we don't mention internships, but here is sometimes nice. She was a blue book stagiaire in, in the fall of 2010 in the cabinet of Ms. Vivian Reding, vice president then of the European Commission and commissioner for justice, fundamental rights and citizenship. Laura André studied law at the University of Liège, Lüttich, uh, Belgium. Laura, without further ado, uh, you have the floor. Thank you for being with us. Thank you very much, Martin, and, and thank you, Isabel, for your presentation. I hope you can hear me. Maybe you can. Oh, perfect. So, um, as Martin just said, uh, the topic of my presentation today is the communication between the tenders and the contracting authority after the award decision. As said by Isabel, um, the EU institutions are not subject to the procurement directive, but we are actually subject to uh, our own set of rules, namely the financial regulation, which is Regulation 2018-1046. The idea of my presentation today is not to describe the entire applicable legal framework with all the exceptions and the specific rules, but more to highlight uh, the key topics that are currently being discussed and challenged before the court of the EU and providing you with concrete examples that I have faced in my uh, daily practice. Next slide, please. Oops, we are frozen. Uh, perfect. So, um, I will uh, discuss three points today. Um, the first one being the communication of the outcomes or the information that is provided to um, tenders and candidates after the award decision, the influence of the standstill periods, and then uh, the influence of this communication and the standstill on the pre-contractual remedies and uh, the most important being uh, the interim procedure before the general court. Next slide, please. So, uh, as uh, Isabel mentioned, uh, the PRB mechanism is a very unique mechanism and the EU institutions are not subject to this mechanism and do not have a similar mechanism in place. So, how do we uh, manage to uh, ensure that we give uh, the tender still a possibility to have a kind of review? Well, in the EU institution, uh, we ensure that the principle of transparency and the right of effective remedy are respected. This is uh, 
of um, the utmost importance uh, when communicating the outcome of a procurement procedure, but also when dealing with the standstill period, as you will see uh, later on. Next, please. First of all, a scene setter, uh, what is the legal framework? What is the exact legal framework applicable? So the financial regulation uh, foresees specific rules relating to the information provided to candidates and tender in Article 170 of the financial regulation and in the point 31 of its Annex 1, which is a, an annex dedicated to procurement rules. The rules on standstill period, on the other hand, are laid down in Article 175, but also in the point 35 of the Annex. It is important to note that uh, the Directive uh, 89665, which is the remedy directive, does not apply as such to the EU institution. However, um, the Van Breda case law that Isabel already mentioned before and that you will see will come back um, quite often in this presentation, uh, has uh, clearly stated that the principles that are laid down in the remedy directive also apply to the EU institutions. Next slide, please. Let's first discuss the communication of the outcomes or the information that is provided to tender and candidates after the award decision. It is important to note that uh, the rules foreseen in the financial regulation should be distinguished from the rules that are foreseen in the access to document regulation, regulation 1049-2001. The Regulation 2049-2001 uh, foresee a general right to access to documents, and this is a key word, and it applies whether or not um, the applicant is a candidate or a tender. It is a general rule applicable to all citizens. Here we are discussing the privileged access uh, that can be um, granted to candidates and tender in the context of procurement procedure, and this access is to information, which is, of course, broader than document. So what is the general rule? Um, the general rule is that there should be a privileged access for all candidates or tenders simultaneously and individually at each step of the procurement procedure. Each step means what? It means that every time that a decision is taken by a contracting authority, the concerned tender should be informed and understand the reasoning behind this decision. Next step, please. Next slide, thank you. Um, the financial regulation uh, still foresees a two-step approach. What is this two-step approach? The first step is we will inform the tenderer of the reason for the rejection of its tender. And then only if this tender makes the request in writing, will it be informed about the name of the tender, that is the winning tender, the characteristic and relative advantages of, its, of the successful tender, and the price or the contract value. Please note, however, that there are certain limits that are foreseen for this um, privileged access uh, of course, um, the contracting authority must um, withhold information that are contrary to the public interest, would prejudice the legitimate commercial interests of um, the other tenderers, and would, of course, uh, distort fair competition. Next, please. Since Van Breda, Isabel mentioned that uh, the ECB has adapted its way of working and has moved away from this two-step approach. However, it is important to note that uh, the General Court uh, of uh, Justice has confirmed the validity of um, the two-step approach. This has been uh, clearly confirmed, for example, in the Transtech judgment that you will see quoted here. However, for the practical reason that Isabel mentioned during her presentation, the Commission always strongly recommends to its services to proactively provide more information than the first step uh, information. The Commission would always suggest to its service 
that they already proactively, directly, without even a written request from the tenderer, uh, provide information on the identity of the winning uh, tenderer, the relative advantage of its tender, and the price or contract value. Next, please. I will make a small aparté uh, to insist again on the importance of the principle of transparency and the right to effective remedy when approaching the communication of the outcomes of a procurement procedure. Why is it so important that um, the tenders are made aware of the reason behind a rejection? Well, it enables the tender to verify if the duty to state reason has been respected by the contracting authority. The court has confirmed that the objective of Article 170, the communication um, between the, uh, to the tenders, is to ensure the right to effective remedy. This is, once again, a um, very important principle that has been, again, highlighted by the court in the Van Breda case law that um, we will mention later on. On this slide, I quote two extracts from the case law that exemplify uh, this importance and the link between duties to state reason and effective remedy. Next, please. Um, why is the duty to state reason so important in procurement procedure? Maybe it is important also to recall the basic principle. Um, a contracting authority has a very, very broad uh, margin of interpretation when uh, deciding on procurement matters. And this is why the court is always uh, putting an emphasis on the duty to state reason and a proper communication with the losing tender so that they are able to understand the reason for their rejection. Once again, the link between transparency and the right of effective remedy is crucial for the court. Next. The court has confirmed that this communication is not a single uh, action. It is an exchange between um, the tenderer and the contracting authority. The contracting authority has a certain obligation, but the tenderer can also participate in the exchange of information and request additional information. It is very important to know that um, the court uh, confirm that the duty to state reason is to be assessed on the basis of the information that is available at the moment of the lodging of the application by the applicant. This means that the communication has an influence on the extent of the duty to state reason by the contracting authority. The contracting authority is in a position to provide um, additional information, additional motivation, and um, build um, a stronger case even after the first letter has been exchanged. You will find here two cases that highlight this uh, principle. Next, please. Coming back to the legal framework, it is also important to really grasp what is the notion of characteristic and relative advantages. Which information in particular should be uh, provided to the uh, tenderer? What does it actually cover? The court has specified that um, the characteristics and relative advantages are the information that allow the tenderer to understand the reasoning for the rejection of its tender. This does not mean that the contracting authority has a duty to provide very detailed information on each and every single point, and this is important. Um, the court has confirmed that a detailed summary of each detail is not to be provided and actually could not be um, in practice provided. A detailed comparative analysis is also not necessary. The purpose is not to compare the different offer, but to provide the different uh, explanation that were underlying the different decision. Next. Oh, seems like a slide is missing. No. Maybe on my side. Um, no problem. Uh, I will just um, um, 
confirm that um, the court also uh, established that no uh, copy, no full copy of the evaluation report should be uh, provided. I will here refer to uh, judgment T536-11, uh, European Dynamics against a European Commission. The, the full copy of the evaluation report is not to be provided, just a relevant extract. I'm um, just saying this because I know that Jeffrey will uh, shortly explain that in Belgian law, this is a bit different. Thank you. Um, in the q and I will be happy to discuss also uh, some uh, recent case law, should you have any question on this. Uh, I'm, I'm putting two examples here of a growing trend of the court to pay more and more attention to the duty to state reason and to the communication and, and the importance of the exchange of communication between the tenders and the contracting authority after the award. Next. Oh, okay, well, here it is. Next one. As already said, uh, the presentation today aims at demonstrating the importance of, of core principle of procurement and how they interact uh, with the rules and the practices um, of a procurement officer. Uh, this is very important when discussing standstill. The standstill is the period uh, after the award decision and before the signature of the contract. It is a period in which the contract may not be signed. This is a key period for the communication between the contracting authority and the tenderer, because it is actually when the tenderer will have the opportunity to raise their objection. What is the objective of the standstill period? The standstill period gives the opportunity to tender to raise requests, comments, provide information that the contracting authority had not known about the winning tender or raise uh, objection about the procedure in general in order to be granted the possibility of a remedy or review. This is also a, a period in which the contracting authority has the opportunity to be made aware of such problem. Sometimes uh, the information provided were not complete and the contracting authority just didn't know some information. In this period, the tender has a proactive role and should uh, notify the contracting authority about any issue. Next slide, please. There are two consequences for such exchange of information during the standstill period. As you will see, point 35 of the annex um, foresees that if um, information provided by the tenderer um, lead to the needs of additional examination, the contracting authority can suspend the signature of the contract in order to do this examination. Sometimes during the standstill period, Following the information provided and the suspension, the contracting authority can come to the realization that indeed there are some flaws in the procedure and um, decide not finally, finally not to award to the first rank tender but to the second rank tender. This is the second paragraph on the slide. It is also to be noted that when the flaws in the procedure does not concern the tenderer that was winning the tender, but the procedure itself, the, sometimes the contracting authority will come to the realization following the, ex, the information provided in the standstill period that the procedure might have to be canceled altogether. Next slide, please. The standstill period is very important. The court has confirmed that the suspension of the procedure following uh, additional information provided by tender should normally only occur um, if uh, the information is provided during the standstill period. This means that this is really the period in which the tender should um, communicate proactively and quickly with the, the contracting authority if they want to, to be um, in a position to request a suspension of the signature of the contract. Next, please. 
The interaction between the communication of the outcomes and the standstill period on one hand, and of the principles of transparency and uh, the right to effective remedy on the other hand, is essential to really grasp the evolution of case law relating to interim procedure. As uh, we have said already several times, the Vazenbreda case law has really been a groundbreaking evolution um, for a procurement practitioner. As you know, to be granted an um, interim measure before the General Court and before the Court of Justice, an applicant should uh, demonstrate that this application is urgent. And this means that normally the application should cause a serious and irreparable harm um, to the applicant. However, this is very difficult. And Isabel was just saying this a couple of minutes ago. Uh, this ex this uh, mandatory requirement was indeed creating um, a barrier to effective remedy because the tender were never in a position to really uh, prove that they would suffer an irreparable harm if the procurement contract was to be signed in the end. This is why in the uh, Van Breda case, um, the Court of Justice has established that in the matter of procurement uh, procedure, in order to warrant the, uh, the principle of effective remedy, it was necessary to ease the condition of urgency. The, the condition of urgency in the matter of procurement is fulfilled as long as the applicant can demonstrate a serious harm and not a serious and irreparable harm. It is important also to specify that this can only occur if two conditions are uh, fulfilled. The first one is, it can only be the case in a particularly serious prima facie case. So the court is really putting an emphasis on the fact that this uh, easing of the condition of urgency is only possible if we have a very very flagrant violation that really occur at first sight. We are talking about a particularly serious prima facie case and not a prima facie, serious prima facie case as is usually required in um, interim procedure. Also, the, the application should be lodged before the signature of the contract. Next, please. However, as said, many times. Transparent communication is key in procurement. And as Isabel uh, mentioned, um, the court has always uh, as, as specified in, in development of case law that the standstill period could only start running if those interested parties, the ones that are uh, lodging the application for interim measure, have sufficient information to ascertain whether the award decision was unlawful in any way. This means that if the communication was not sufficiently complete on the side of the contracting authority, the standstill period could not run. This is one why, once again, the Commission always proactively uh, insists that um, the services provide as much information as possible from the start. The standstill period is also key because the General Court has uh, specified over the year that um, the condition of um, introducing the action before the signature of the, con of the contract should actually be understood as introducing the action during the standstill period. This means that the standstill is really a key period for the tender because not only do they have to communicate proactively with the contracting authority, but also if they are uh, faced with a very particularly serious prima facie case, they should also introduce an action before the general court in the standstill period if they want to benefit uh, from the easing of the condition of uh, urgency and uh, be in a position actually to um, be granted a suspension of the contract. It is worth noting because uh, Isabel mentioned that it was a case in the ECB and I think uh, Jeff will also mention this later on, that uh, the interim procedure before the general court is in principle not suspensive. 
However, in our practice, we have noted that uh, in the last years, it is nearly systematical that the, com the general court will issue a preliminary order when faced with a procurement case to suspend the signature until uh, the issuance of the order. It is also worth noting that the procedure before the general court uh, in um, interim usually lasts between two and four months. Next, please. As a conclusion, I, I just want to highlight um, that in procurement, it is always important to come back to the basic principle, such as uh, the principle of transparency and effective remedy that have been highlighted here. I think it will be very interesting in the following year to note, um, to see how the case law of the general court will still involve on this matter, as we have seen in the recent year, very interesting developments and more and more the contracting authority being requested to provide very accurate information in a very precise way. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Somehow, I don't know, one can sense that uh, you are involved in some of these cases. Um, there's always a glimpse of insider knowledge which uh, shines through uh, the explanation of the case. It's very likely many thanks uh, for that uh, introduction and sight into the financial regulation approach to this information. Uh, I go to the uh, final, last but not least, speaker who will round off the two first introductions. Uh, Jeffrey Dierichs will uh, speak about the legal remedies against the award decisions from a national law perspective. As a staff member of the National Bank of Belgium, the speaker will first highlight the provisions of the Belgian procurement law on the obligations of uh, contracting authorities to inform tenderers after an award decision. The provisions are, of course, based on the EU procurement directive, and therefore there are similarities uh, to the procurement law of other member states as well, obviously, but they're not always directly. Furthermore, the presentation will focus on legal remedies against award decisions under Belgian law, with special attention for pre-contractual remedies. Um, here we may see some national features which uh, deserve highlighting. Jeff will do that. Finally, in the absence of a national law framework on interne internal review procedures, the presentation will examine alternative methods for contracting authorities to increase transparency and monitor the legal soundness of their award decisions with the aim of avoiding unnecessary litigation with tenders. A little bit on Jeff. Uh, Jeff Lyrix is a senior uh, advisor and head of group in the legal department of National Bank of Belgium, Banque Nationale de Belgique. He joined National Bank of Belgium, NBB, in 2011, immediately after finishing his law studies at the University of Leuven, KU Leuven. Currently, he works as a senior legal counsel and head of the corporate law division in the legal department of the NBB. In 2017, Jeff was seconded to the ECB on a short-term basis where he worked for the Institutional Law Division. So we both had the pleasure to work closely with him of the Director General Legal Services. Jeff has experience in various areas of law, in particular institutional law, corporate governance, accounting law, fiscal law, public access, and public procurement law. Within the Eurosystem, Jeff is member of the Legal Committee Task Force on uh, Value Added Tax Issues, VAT issues, and of the Ethics and Compliance Conference. A little bit on the background, because it's important. I think Jeff has, has also a musical career, um, which he actually started with, but uh, he became a, a brilliant lawyer as well. He's active as a musician, a pianist and conductor, and I'm, I uh, experienced him live at the, the last meeting um, of, uh, in, in this context of, of choirs. Among other musical activities, he's the conductor and co-founder of the Bank Notes, a choir of National Bank of Belgique uh, staff members. So, noted. On this musical note, hand over to Jeff. Thank you, Jeff, for being with us. Thank, thank you so much, Martin, for this uh, kind introduction. Uh, I want to thank you and, of course, uh, also Chiara uh, for the opportunity to, uh, to participate to this panel. Uh, and also, of course, my uh, co-panelists, uh, Isabel and Laura, for their uh, very uh, interesting 
uh, presentations. It already has been a very interesting morning for me, and I will try to uh, complement it with uh, some of my uh, views uh, on the topic. Uh, as Martin uh, already mentioned, I'm a staff member of the National Bank of Belgium, a um, uh, member of uh, its legal department. And as such, I will look into the topic from a national law perspective, complementing the previous presentations that uh, tackled the, the issue uh, from, uh, from an EU law uh, perspective. Uh, next slide, please. So um, my presentation is built up around four, uh, four, um, four uh, topics. I will briefly highlight uh, the legal framework. Um, and then, of course, first we have to discuss uh, the, the transparency obligations, because as was already uh, highlighted very, very clearly in the in the previous presentations, when we speak about legal protection uh, in, an, in, a, in a procurement law framework, um, then, of course, we have to speak about uh, giving information to, to tenderers and in particular unsuccess unsuccessful tenderers because providing sufficient information really is a prerequisite for any form of uh, effective legal protection. Uh, third, I will uh, dive into uh, the external review procedures that are available to tenderers under Belgian law. Um, uh, and I will focus indeed on the pre contractual remedies um, because those uh, are the most uh, effective. Uh, and we will discuss a bit uh, how the procedure, the application for suspension, um, is um, is um, is is, uh, is can can be can be can be um, can be submitted uh, before the Council of State in Belgium, which is the highest administ administrative court. Um, last, I will look into uh, the internal review mechanisms a bit. This is, of course, because I understood that um, the, the topic of today was inspired by the 15th birthday of the procurement review body of the ECB, the PRB, uh, which is, of course, a highly sophisticated internal review mechanism. And when I worked for the ECB, uh, I benefited from seeing how it worked uh, from, from the inside a bit, and it was uh, very, very interesting. Uh, we do not have such uh, mechanisms uh, in Belgium. We do not have it in the National Bank of uh, Belgium, and we do not have it in Belgian law. So uh, there, um, it, it, I mean, it, it, I, uh, my presentation would be quite similar to, to Laura's uh, presentation. Uh, but I will highlight some uh, of the uh, approaches that we try and that we developed over the years um, as an alternative, because we have some informal ways of providing some uh, internal uh, review, uh, which is not as formalized or as sophisticated as the PRB, but, but which, which might serve uh, as an alternative. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, briefly on the, on the legal framework, I think a lot of you in the audience uh, also work for national institutions, so this will be quite similar to you. Of course, a procurement law is to some extent harmonized in the EU. We have in particular two uh, directives that are of particular interest for us, the procurement directive and the remedies directive when we speak about uh, legal protection. And of course, these uh, directives are transposed uh, um, in Belgian law in various legal instruments, which are shown on this slide. Uh, next slide, please. So. Um, I think it was already um, highlighted uh, and, and clarified uh, very extensively in the, in the previous presentations, but I just want to come back briefly on this. Um, of course, um, the starting point for effective legal protection is always the information that is given to, to a tenderer. Uh, once an award decision has been made, um, there are, of course, transparency obligations in, uh, in the legal frameworks, whereas in, in the ECB legal framework, in the financial regulation, and also in the procurement directives uh, and in uh, the national legal frameworks. And the, 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 the aim, the objective is always the same. In order to be able to assess uh, the award decision um, and to be able to assess and evaluate its correctness and uh, decide whether or not it makes sense to challenge the award decision uh, in a review procedure, of course, a tender has to receive all uh, relevant information and the necessary uh, information to be able to do this. Next slide, please. So in the, in the following slides, I've summarized the obligations under Belgian law. 
uh, I think uh, for 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 other uh, uh, legal experts working for national institutions, it, this will be quite familiar, because of course Belgian law is, is based on the EU um, directives. Um, I would say, uh, and we can go immediately, I think, to the next slide. Um, the the most important message uh, is that uh, uh, that of course the idea is always that a tenderer has to has to has to understand why a certain decision is made for example why uh, his bid uh, was uh, considered uh, non admissible or why his bid being admissible was not chosen but another uh, tender was uh, considered uh, more favorable so this uh, this information has to be shared uh, with uh, with a tender in particular a non successful tender um, and um, in Belgium, we have uh, we don't have a two-step approach, uh, as was explained before, but we have a one-step approach, uh, at least for contracts above a certain uh, value. Uh, this doesn't apply for for very low uh, value contracts, but the, the general the, the general approach is a one-step approach where we immediately and proactively share all relevant information and even in uh, in cases of tenders which uh, which submitted a successful an, an, an admissible uh, offer uh, even the entire uh, um, award report um, this also uh, this also applies to uh, situations where a contracting authority decides not to award the tender because of course a contract authority always has the option not to award but this also has to be a reasoned decision uh, subject to transparency obligations um, i'll come back to this later next slide please of course as already as was already mentioned by laura there are some exceptions to the transparency principle of course some information might be of a confidential nature and then the contracting authority should not share such uh, information okay so now we have shared uh, all necessary information with the tenderer. And then, of course, uh, there is something very important that happens. This is the standstill period. Uh, we have this standstill period of 15 days uh, un uh, under Belgian law. Uh, during this standstill period, uh, the contracting authority cannot conclude the contract. And this period allows the tenderer to assess uh, the correctness of, uh, of the award decision. If an application for suspension, which is the pre-contractual remedy under Belgian law, uh, is submitted, then this standstill period is extended until uh, the review body, being the Council of State in Belgium, uh, has delivered its judgment. There are cases when where no standstill applies. I won't go into those uh, cases in detail. I, I think the most important to mention is that for contracts below the European threshold amounts, uh, there is no standstill period, which means that under Belgian law, for contracts below the thresholds, the, the legal protection is, uh, is, is clearly less effective uh, than for contracts uh, above these thresholds. Next slide, please. Okay, so now um, let's talk, so now let's talk about these uh, this ex external uh, review possibility uh, before the, the Belgian Council of State. And in, in particular, the pre-contractual um, remedy, um, because this is the one that is most effective, that is most often used, and which we also see in practice. Uh, we, of course, have also other uh, remedies, other uh, review procedures. I will briefly mention them, uh, but I will not go into detail um, uh, on, on them. What does this mean, uh, pre-contractual uh, remedies? Well, it means uh, pre-contractual remedy. Well, it means that during the standstill, so before a contract is concluded in the in the period between the award decision has been made and the conclusion of the contract, there a tenderer really can challenge um, an award decision and try to seek a remedy that will uh, correct uh, the infringement. Uh, where the, the tenderer will still have a chance afterwards to um, to to be the, the chosen tenderer and to and to and to be to be the, the contractor uh, with which uh, with whom the, um, uh, the the contracting authority finally concludes the contract. So this, uh, I would say, is is a is a is a very important feature of uh, such pre uh, pre contractual remedy because it really uh, allows a possibility of correcting. Uh, an infringement. 
So what do we have in Belgium? We have the possibility to apply for suspension or other interim measures before the Council of State. The time limits to introduce such uh, such uh, such application, of course, uh, um, is the same as the standstill period. Um, it's a quite uh, effective remedy in the sense that the Council of State uh, works quite fast and uh, delivers its judgment in principle within the month after submit submission of the application. Um, and it's also, I would say, the bar for uh, unsuccessful tenderers to cross uh, in, this, uh, in this sort of procedure is uh, relatively low in the sense that they don't have to demonstrate urgency or serious or irre irreparable harm. It is sufficient that they, that they demonstrate a prima facie case um, based on serious grounds or an apparent illegality. I will come back to this later. So this, I would say, is our um, pre-contractual remedy under Belgian law. As I said, we have other procedures. We have the application for annulment before the Council of State. And then on the next slide, you will see that we uh, also have, of course, the possibility to apply for damages, declaration of ineffectiveness, and um, a review body can also uh, impose alternative penalty penalties, but I will not uh, go in uh, detail uh, on this. Next slide, please. So my conclusion would be that we do have uh, under Belgian law, uh, based on the EU directive, uh, effective pre-contractual remedies uh, for tenders, at least above th those above the European threshold amounts. Uh, stand still uh, in combination with uh, this possibility to apply for suspension, a quick uh, judgment. Um, uh, it is sufficient to demonstrate a prima facie case, of course, and this is different from uh, what Isabel uh, clarified on the PRB. Um, the Council of State cannot substitute for, uh, for the contracting authority. Um, and it can only uh, sanction manifest errors. So the, it, 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 of course, uh, has to respect the broad margin of discretion a contracting authority enjoys. Um, what would happen? Uh, what happens if the Council of State does suspend the uh, the award procedure? Um, then the normal course of business would be that the contracting authority would revoke its decision, um, and then of course the contracting authority can reassess the matter, uh, take a new award decision, uh, taking into account the judgment or decide not to award the, uh, the, the tender and possibly re-tender. Next slide. Okay, so this is, uh, we just discussed the, uh, the external review mechanism under Belgian law, in particular the pre-contractual one. Uh, as I mentioned before, I will now highlight um, what we can do internally uh, as a contracting authority under Belgian law. Um, of course, the Remedies Directive does provide for the possibility to, uh, to, uh, to cater for uh, internal review uh, mechanisms, um, but the Belgian legislature did not transpose this. So in, in Belgian law, uh, we do not have a legal framework comparable to the ECD with its uh, PRB uh, procedure. We do not have this sort of institutionalized, formalized internal review bodies uh, and, and mechanisms. Uh, next slide, please. Um, you might consider this as a, as a missed opportunity by the Belgian legislature. Uh, we also see that in other areas of law, we do have these kinds of uh, internal review mechanisms. For example, uh, in education law, we see that there are internal review possibilities against uh, decisions of educational institutions. We also have similar, uh, similar review mechanisms internally uh, when it comes to public access decisions, but we don't, do not have it in procurement law. Um, in the preparatory texts of the Belgian legislature, no reasons were given. Uh, legal scholars did not comment it, so we have to guess about reasons. I put some in the slides, but it's, of course, pure speculation. Uh, perhaps reasons were of a budgetary nature, because, of course, these sort of uh, uh, highly sophisticated internal review mechanisms uh, also demand resources. Um, as you know, the, 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 the government structure in Belgium is also quite complex, so this might also have been an obstacle. And perhaps the legislator thought, okay, um, this external review mechanism before the Council of State will already be highly effective. We, de we do not need uh, an additional layer. But this is, of course, all uh, speculation. Um, let's go to the next slide. 
So, but even in the absence of a, of a legal framework on internal review mechanisms, we as a contracting authority do try uh, to seek um, um, alternative approaches and we try to seek ways to, to reach the same, I would say, uh, to, uh, in, in aim of the same objectives as the PRB of the ECB. Uh, uh, with a name of, um, of, um, of, of providing additional guarantees for unsuccessful tenderers, enhancing good governance, and avoiding uh, unnecessary litigation. So what do we do? And I think I can refer to, to, to the introducing uh, introductory remarks of uh, Martin, where he discussed uh, the importance of uh, efficient communication uh, between a contracting authority and, uh, and, uh, and, 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 and tenders. And I can confirm that we see that this works in practice. So uh, if, and I mean, a crucial period, as was said by Laura, is of course this standstill period. Um, and uh, if, uh, you know, if an unsuccessful tenderer um, uh, approaches us during the standstill period with additional questions, uh, after we already proactively provided the entire award report, uh, then, of course, we, we answer such questions in detail, um, of course, taking into account possible confidentiality restraints, but we really try also, if necessary, to enter in a dialogue with tenderers and possibly also their lawyers to really try to make them understand why uh, the bank made a certain decision. And we already saw uh, in practice that this might help to clear up misunderstandings and really avoid uh, litigation afterwards. Of course, if there is really a substantial, uh, subst a substantive complaint uh, by a tenderer against an award decision, then we also try to look into this in a thorough way and, 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 and try to do um, an as independent as possible uh, second assessment of the decision. And there we as lawyers from the legal department also uh, are involved uh, in, this, in, this, uh, in, this, uh, in this uh in this procedure. And if we find that there is a manifest error um, be, um, um, with, uh, that resulted in the, in, the, in, the, in the award decision in question, then we will also advise our decision makers to revoke the decision. And this is something that, we already, that we've already done in the past. Once a decision is revoked, we can reassess the situation. Uh, we, can, uh, we can come to a new award decision or decide not to award the tender and possibly uh, retender. Next slide, please. Um, this uh, this was uh, during standstill, but also after the standstill, and once an application uh, for uh, for uh, for suspension has been uh, submitted to the Council of State. Also, in this case, we still do this sort of uh, own uh, reassessment of a decision. So if, a, if, a, if an application for suspension is, is introduced, then normally the Council of State would give us two weeks uh, to prepare our defense. And during these uh, two weeks, we do a reassessment of the decision. We do it uh, together with our external law firm. And again, if we find that there is a manifest error, then we will proactively revoke the decision which means that the procedure before the Council of State becomes devoid of purpose and will not be continued and we avoid further litigation and the Council of State doesn't have to look into the matter uh, on substance. Then, of course, again, we can reassess the situation, uh, take a new award decision or decide not to award the tender in question. Next slide. Uh, no, uh, let's go back perhaps to a previous slide, uh, because I just wanted to, to tell you uh, that that this uh, is something that we also did in practice uh, quite recently. So there was a, a recent tender where uh, two tenderers were very close to one another. Uh, the, they were separated by less than a point in, uh, in on a scale of 100 points. Um, and so in the first award decision, we awarded the, 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 the contract, uh, the, uh, the award decision was in favor of, of the, the tender that was ranked first uh, in a fir uh, on the basis of a first assessment. This was attacked before the Council of State by the tenderer that was ranked second. And when we looked into this, um, uh, into this um, uh, application for suspension, we found that there was indeed a procedural flaw on the basis of the first uh, award decision, and we revoked that award decision. Then afterwards, we reassessed uh, the matter and we made a new award decision, this time 
uh, uh, awarding the, the tender to the tenderer that was ranked second in the initial uh, award decision. Of course, this uh, provoked a new, uh, a new uh, litigation procedure before the Council of State by the tenderer that was uh, initially ranked first, but this time we were convinced that the second award decision was the right one, was correct. We defended it before the Council of State and the Council of State upheld this decision and implicitly um, sh showing appreciation for, um, for, our, uh, for our approach where the bank, the National Bank, um, admitted um, the, the, the problem uh, that existed with the first award decision, revoked it and then reassessed the matter um, and came to another uh, uh, conclusion. Okay, I think we can go to the final slide. These are just some, I would say, thought experiments that I added. Um, I will not go into these uh, in detail. Um, I think I can I can end my presentation here. I would like to thank you all for your uh, attention, um, and I can give the floor back to to Martin. Thank you, Jeff. That was really nicely rounding off uh, this panel. We have now looked at uh, the PRB. Um, mechanism which one institution has and which we have at the ECB. We have the context uh, on the uh, from the European Commission as the experienced, um, let's say, um, lit litigator on, on many cases, also explaining how the framework is for all other institutions. And Jeff, you gave then the framework and rounding off out on the national side and how you also uh, try to, of course, have a very uh, effective uh, remedy process in Belgium. Uh, we will now have a few minutes for questions. We are, uh, we probably have five to ten minutes and we try to uh, finish up by five past. Um, I will take my uh, chair privilege and ask uh, to all three uh, one question, actually to Laura and Jeff one and to Isabel another one. Uh, Laura and Jeff and maybe Laura can start. Would you wish to have a PRB procedure? And to Isabel I would like to ask, would you wish to not have a PRB procedure? Uh, Laura, can you? What's your view? Well, I must say that I've been very impressed by uh, the presentation that Isabel gave on, on the PRB, and it, it seems to be a very effective mechanism in the sense that it is quite uh, time efficient, but also it really gives uh, the consulting authority the opportunity to review again with a different uh, information, uh, the one provided by the tenderer, um, the award decision. However, from a practical point of view, and I think that uh, Jeff hinted uh, the, the matter uh, earlier in his presentation, I, I must say that I, 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 fear, I, I don't understand how you manage to, to review all this procedure internally, because in terms of resources and, and in terms of, uh, of workload, this must be enormous. So when I see the implication that uh, litigation required before the court, uh, reviewing all this procedure must uh, require a lot of expertise and a lot of uh, time and, and, and efforts. Thank you, Laura. Jeff, what do you think? I, I fully agree with uh, Laura. Um, I, I'm perfectly willing to, uh, to, to take on uh, this challenge of a, of a PRB in Belgium, but then I will have to convince my board to strongly reinforce my team. Uh, this, is, uh, this is, I would say, a, a first point of thought. Uh, I really see the merit uh, in uh, in what the ECB does, and I really think it it, it provides for an additional uh, guarantee of uh, an additional layer of uh, of legal protection. Um, however, I must say that I'm also convinced that what we do uh, in Belgium on a more informal basis also works, and that we also see uh, see the results uh, the results of this. Thank you, Jeff. Isabel, I fully support Jeff on this. Uh, the the informal communication after the award is really key and, and as Jeff mentioned we have seen many cases where just an improved communication has, has lead to uh, avoiding litigation uh, very effectively. Which is what we all strive for. Isabel, would you not wish to have a PAB being the secretary and in charge and you heard Laura and Jeff, we need more resources. Yeah, if, if you ask for my personal view, of course, <clears throat> you know, uh, wanting to go on vacation and receiving several appeals at the same time, I would say, I don't want to have this procedure in place anymore. At least I do not want to be the secretary of the PRB. Um, but for, for legal reasons, um, um, 
it's it's true what you say that uh, also on an, in in an informal manner lots of these cases can be solved um so if if um sometimes we receive uh requests where it says this is an PRB appeal, but in reality, it's a request for an additional information. Um, so also on that, we, we interpret it then as an additional information request. And um, if we get in contact with the tenderer and speak and explain more the background, sometimes these cases are solved. Um, and um, on the other hand, it also helps to have a formalized procedure um, with rules of procedure and, and, which, and, and, and to be sure that it's really an objective procedure. Um, so I think um, seeing also having a look at the figures, we can see that 10% uh, uh, of the appeals that we received were really upheld, and um, and a lot of uh, a lot of appeals didn't go through the uh, to the court, court of justice. So um, I've been at the ECB for 15 years, and um, I've always most of the time I've been in this procurement law team, and I've only had two court cases on on general procurement related matters. We had a couple of, of uh, court cases earlier, which was related to the building of the new ECB premises, which was a, perhaps a little bit different. But um, yeah, I'm convinced. So for transparency reasons and uh, to to provide an effective remedy before uh, bringing the matter to the court, uh, this is a very good mechanism. Thank you. Uh, I would then uh, give the floor to the audience. And I understand we have uh, questions uh, from uh, two. Uh, um, participants, we have at the moment 90 participants in this in this panel. Despina Lupi first and then Angeliki Mavromati, please. Despina. Despina's gone, not uh, then I would give the floor to the next one on the list, Angeliki Mavromati. There she is. Good morning. Um, Hello. Aniliki, do, do you want to? Yes. Yes. Can you turn your video on? Yes. Also? Thank you. Okay. You might be able to see me now. Hopefully. Perfect. Yes. Okay. So first of all, thank you to all the panelists for the very interesting and informative presentations. It was an insightful morning indeed. Um, as a follow up to Martin's question, um, I was wondering, given the differences between the PRB and the ECB's approach to the process and then the two-step approach in the Commission and the Belgian one-step approach, um, would you say that the system you have established works best given the specific characteristics of your respective organization? And based on your experience so far, do you recognize specific advantages and disadvantages on your established internal review procedure? So the question is related to uh, either of the panelists, I would say. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. Then maybe let's start, Laura and uh, Jeff. Then. Well, thank you. Um, I must say that um, on on a personal note, uh, I'm of course not uh, representing the Commission when saying this. I would consider that a one-step approach is is more efficient and and maybe more clear. Um, this is also why we strongly recommend to the service to always uh, go for, for this approach, um, uh, providing proactively all information from the start, not only on, on the lose on the tender that that has uh, lost the tender, but also on the winning tender and its relative uh, characteristic and advantage. It's maybe more clear and also um, dismiss the whole discussion on when the standstill should start. So uh, this is uh, definitely something uh, that that could be maybe um, um, improve. Um, and then the second part of the question was, uh, um, can, can you maybe go? Okay. If you recognize specific disadvantages or advantages, and if it works best given the respective characteristics of your organization. Thank you. Um, I think that having not having a PRB uh, works quite well at the moment for, for the commission. Um, as said, and, and the, the communication and the informal communication um, uh, mechanism is actually quite helpful. We have a lot of interaction uh, with Stender. I think what what is important is that the legal service is involved as soon as um, there is um, some questions that are raised in the post-award phase. Uh, usually, if, if 
the legal service is involved and we managed to um, to have a proper communication and, and quite a comprehensive one with, with the tenderer, most litigation can be avoided. Thank you, Laura. Jeff, any comments from your side? Yes, I, I would I would agree with Laura. I think that uh, that giving proactively as much information as possible is the is the best way to to tackle the the, the, the issue, to avoid litigation, and to really to really make tenders understand why a certain decision was made. Um, so I think our our approach we are I mean we don't we do not have a choice because under Belgian law we are obliged to 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 apply the one step approach and to even uh, share the entire award uh, decision the entire award report. I mean in this way we already uh, give information that would be asked for uh, anyway uh, in a second step. So I think we also win time by doing this. Um, yeah, I, I agree with everything that was uh, said previously by Laura and Jeff. And uh, I would just like to add that um, one of the reasons why we also changed our approach, not just because of Van Breda forced us to, is that um, we felt we should give out more information in the in the first step, right in the in the outcome letter for transparency reasons. Um, and um, and I think that's the way it should work. And of course, another step more, uh, which is the the, the fact and um, which are you are doing in the commission and in, uh, in 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 the in the national bank, uh, uh, Jeff, is that uh, you you give out even more information than you would be obliged to, and that would be something that we we would consider as well. Of course, always weighing against the administrative burden, and um, yeah, and also wondering whether it would prompt more requests than less. But that's of course another matter. Thank you, thank you, uh, Isabel, and thanks for the question. And Eliki, I see that Despina is. Uh... Now, online, Despina, you had another question. Hi, good morning. I hope you can hear me now. Um, first of all, thanks to everyone for the very interesting presentations. They were very concise and informative. Um, I would have two short questions, mainly for Isabel. Um, you mentioned that the PRB, the internal procedure, is um, only available for public procedures. After all of these years of experience, um, since you, I think we can conclude that it is an effective way to reduce litigation in front of the court. Would this be an argument to extend also the scope to non-public procedures? This would be my first question. And a, first, um, a second small question uh, would be if you can give us a practical example uh, where a, a tender brought a procurement case before the European Ombudsman, since you mentioned also um, the Ombudsman in your presentation. Thanks a lot. Am I unmuted now? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you, Despina. Um, yeah, to your first question, uh, whether it would also be feasible to, to apply the PRB procedure to non-public procedures. Um, uh, yes, uh, definitely. If uh, we get more headcount, uh, I would say. Uh, it, this this would be a possibility. And we we only have um, one month uh, to to respond and to issue um, a PRB decision, um, so it's a quite tight time frame. And if we applied this this procedure also to the non-public procedures, so all the three five quotes that we have, even call off procedures, it would be very difficult to manage. Um, so I suppose that. This was at the time when the PRB was established. Um, one of the reasons why we only allowed for it uh, in public tender procedures. So it's basically it's practically uh, or mainly a question of, of, of effort as well. And uh, yeah, your second question, European Ombudsman. So you, the, the, the request to the or complaints to the European Ombudsman can always be uh, submitted um, in, in addition to an appeal procedure. And um, um, I don't. I, I don't have. I didn't have one my, my, myself, and it was we had we had already complaints to the European Ombudsman, but it was more related to employment law matters. So um, on procurement law matters, not that I remember. So it's rather if if tenders want to complain, it's more appeal procedure or court. And uh, yeah, so I hope that answers your question. Thank you very much, yeah. Isabel. Thank, Thank you, you. Spina, for the for the question. I'm looking to the list. There are no further questions uh, from the outside world. I would have loved to have a 
still a conversation amongst the panel members, but looking to the to the watch, I think we're a bit uh, 10 minutes over. So probably rather close also for the benefit of the following panel. Many thanks for the uh, excellent contributions. I start external, uh, Laura, Andre, bravo. Thank you for also defending the interests of the European Commission in, in these cases and uh, making sure that the court makes more uh, good case law on this. Uh, excellent you. presentation. Many thanks, Isabel, also for the, is it 15 years of PAB Secretariat? Maybe not fully, but uh, yeah, all, uh, in, almost. involvement in this for very long. Uh, and Jeff for really blending into this and, and finding a place that really rounded off, uh, it was really, uh, as we hoped, uh, this, uh, this presentation and, and giving the kind of national aspect uh, of this uh, thing, uh, of, the, of, the, um, uh, of the procedure uh, that we have in relation to the tenders and the access for information. I would also like to thank um, uh, Monica Benutis, who was uh, here in charge of, uh, the, of the clicking the the, the, the slides and all the setup and Tonchitsa Radovcic is also in the room. Uh, we also have uh, Javed Gafu from the Webex team and many thanks to the whole legal services team who made uh, a lot of work to make that happen. Thank you very much. And uh, we close the panel four here and have a little break until 11 o'clock when panel five will start. Thank you for attending. Goodbye.